Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Robert Baharian and this is Masters in Investing. On this show, I talk to guests about financial markets, the economy, investing, and business. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us an awesome review. Let's get into it. My guest today is James Sinclair, CEO of Signature Hospitality Group, with brands such as The Sporting Globe and TGI Fridays. In our conversation today, we discuss bringing new ideas to life, the constant growth of those new ideas, systemizing processes, and we talk about the outlook for the entertainment and food and beverage industry in Australia. Hope you enjoy my conversation today. Let's get straight into it. James Sinclair, welcome to Masters in Investing. Thanks for having me, Robert. I'm excited to be with you. Awesome. Um, mate, um, it's been uh, 12 or 13 years now when you had an idea of bringing an American sports bar concept from the US to Australia. Now, I think a lot, and I'm talking more specifically about the, the Sporting Globe. Now, the Sporting Globe's kind of started to be, become a bit of an icon um, in, in Australia, uh, and you can see the big footprints that, that, the, that the venue is, is making. When you brought that concept here, there's, it's not like that's the first time someone's ever thought about that. And there's a saying that goes something along the lines of, if you've come up with an idea, uh, it's, someone's probably already thought about it and they haven't executed on it, right? Why, why hadn't anybody done this before? Why hadn't anybody brought that concept that was the, almost the norm in, in the US to Australia? And if, and if they had, why didn't they execute it as well as, as you and, and Signature Hospitality did? Um, well, great question. I think, uh, as you say, I mean, a sports bar is a pretty, um, uh, you know, generic idea, concept. A lot of guys, young guys think, oh, wouldn't that be a great thing? And so many people I've talked to that think, have said to me similarly, oh, I would have loved to have done something of that vein. Um, and I think there had been small incarnations that you've seen spotted around yep. the place um, that have yep. tried certain things. Um, so I guess to your point, I still thought there was a gap uh, in the market in a big way from an execution view as well. Um, the, even just the idea of a sports bar, uh, when we talk to people in Australia about what that was, um, because we've got quite a big sports betting um, uh, area and business in Australia with TAB, um, when people talked about a sports bar, they thought about the corner of a pub with being a tab with yep. bloke in overalls, drinking VB and swearing at the Greyhounds. Now, that was a world away from the vision that I had, um, which was uh, far more like a, a contemporary US sports bar, which was full of young people, um, a lot broad mix, 50-50 um, male, female, huge amount of games and content and really an amazing f and experience. Great food, great craft beer um, and, you know, just a huge amount of fun. And I saw there were some fundamentals um, going in the right way to invest in that sort of market too. Um, so, so one, I thought, I thought the, um, the, the concept here hadn't been done um, the same way the US had executed and, and two, the sports content that really fueled sports bar success a lot in the US was coming to Australia with a lot more content. I mean, we've got Thursday night football now. We didn't used to have that. Um, we, we, the, the amount of content um, across all different codes getting broadcast now, including international sport, um, is enormous. Uh, sport's our favourite pastime in Australia, but the hours we consume each week now of sport content, be it either watching or reading about sport, every single year over the last decade has grown and grown and grown. When the Murdochs um, sold out of um, their media empire, sold parts of it, the parts they kept was Fox Sports. And the reason was they said that exact fact, sport content um, is the way of the future. Second part, I think also, as I said, from an f and view, I think um, there was an opportunity to do things of a higher level. And um, again, we're in a when you say high level, do you mean at a high level and quality? High level of quality, yeah. High level of quality, right. So when I first opened the venue in Geelong, we had eight beers on tap. 
And I remember being told, no pub really needs more than three beers. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you got eight beers now. You don't have enough, man. <laughs> yeah, it won't work. So again, but I, I believed in that. I, I believed in having variety and some craft beer offerings. Um, and today we average about 14 beers on tap. Um, on top of that, the pr- product and food we did, I mean, we bought buffalo wings. And I remember the first venue, it was 50-50 when I delivered buffalo wings to a table as to whether people would spit them out and say they were disgusting and why would you serve that and, or love them. And a lot of people didn't know what a buffalo wing was, you know, mm-hmm. 11, 12 years ago. Um, and, uh, and now, you know, they're, they're incredibly popular and, and a staple. So product innovation like that and then quality, like even something as basic as a chicken parmigiana from day one, um, you know, I really believed how important it was to have the food first, food right first. So again, we've always been a food driven business where we believed get that right. Don't make just a normal fro- buy in a frozen chicken parmigiana and deep fry it. We always bought in fresh chicken breast, hand crumb, Japanese bread crumb. Um, you know, we grilled it um, instead of frying it, um, used a, a, you know, Parmesan mix on the cheese. And then, and then served it with homemade Napoli sauce and, and a, the best quality chip from Tasmania we could. So just doing those basics and being really committed to, um, to high quality, uh, I think has, has really helped us get ahead. The, the example of buffalo, buffalo wings you, you gave, it, it reminds me, um, Henry Ford, before or when he, when he invented the Ford, uh, he was asked, he, he, the quote went something like this, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would tell me they want, would want faster horses. <laughs> and it's almost this, this, that it, it reminded me of that when you talk about bringing these concepts to consumers and you either are guided by what your consumers want versus leading them. And I think really good examples are companies like um, Apple's just doing this insanely well which is uh almost leading the consumers and telling them what they want and what they need yeah. is how how different that approach with when setting setting up the sporting globe um how different that approach that you took when setting it up you use the buffalo wing, wings as an example maybe if you asked your customers if they wanted buffalo wings maybe it wouldn't even be on the damn menu because nobody likes the thing but i'm just curious how you overcome that um new uh, experience that your customers are facing with a concept that you strongly believe in how do you overcome that because that that that's in in all business yeah. all business most business people have got great ideas but trying to then overcome their customers is the biggest challenge 100%. what's your advice there look i mean ultimately the customer's always right so eventually we we're judged and our success relates to what they believe and and their view is critical but um I think in all innovation, um, you need to have a vision and you need to be really clear about it and you need to give it a go. Um, and I encourage people to, to have a go and, and back in their ideas if they've done their homework and have conviction around an idea. Um, Minimise the downside, which is really important in business. How do you do that? Uh, well, with all things, work out, okay, what's the worst thing that could happen here? I think Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger once said, you know, when they look at an evaluated investment, they, they think, what do I need to do here to look like an idiot? Um, and just by taking that contrary view, you can think about the mm-hmm. worst case and then try and minimise whatever the downside might be. Uh, and so say, for example, when we launched the wings um, and, you know, if that had have continued to go badly and the feedback was consistently, this is wrong, this is not good, we hate it. Um, after a period of, of trial and, and conviction around that, we would have changed and we've had examples of things that we've tried that haven't worked um, that I would have liked to have worked and again you, you minimize your downside by setting a time frame of how long we will be committed mm. and go at this with absolute conviction that it's right and going to work at a point we need to cut your losses and change tact and listen to your customer now I was fortunate with the wings while the initial feedback was bad the, the people that loved it kept, kept coming back each week and we eventually built enough um, enough uh, loyal customers that did enjoy it um, that slowly um, gave people or built us enough customer base 
and and, um, and maybe convinced others to give it another try. And, and we tweaked as we went along with flavor profile, um, an example of some of the sauces, um, if they're a bit too strong, you can mix with butter, um, little tweaks to soften things, to make things, um, make the product the best it can be. The, your, your, the concept of, and I just sort of think about this when you talk about systematic processes, which is, it's not about what James Sinclair thinks about the buffalo wings, if they're good or they're bad, and whether you want to be right or whether you, you don't want to be wrong. It's about having that belief, and is what I'm hearing from you, but then having an unemotional systematic process in place with a timeline that says these are the key metrics. If we're not hitting these things, then i got to kind of put my ego to the side and, and know this is not about me. It's about the product and it's about whether our customers like the product or not, and then being able to just walk away with it, walk away from it. 100%. And, you know, all entrepreneurs and everything we do, you've got to accept that, um, that not everything's going to work out and being able to fail well um, is something people talk to and, and it's critical to be successful in business, I believe. Do you think that's, that's far more accepted now, James? That is the, the failure or the public, especially with social media nowadays, it's, you know, access to information and um, is, is so easy and people's ability to be able to execute, well, it doesn't change the fact whether people are able to execute or not, I feel like people are far more open to talking about failures and things that didn't work in maybe the pursuit of bettering themselves or giving other people an opportunity to learn from those mistakes. I just, I'm just wondering how different that is now compared to maybe 10 years ago where failure was almost frowned upon and, and people were shunning away from talking about failures. You're probably right. I mean, the, just the, the cycle of business is probably, it's, it's increased dramatically. So you're going to see, I mean, we're seeing more startups than what you would have 10 years ago. Um, so, you know, the pace of innovation um, is, is enormous. And as a result, just on pure numbers, you're going to see more failure. And I think 100% to your point, I think culturally, um, you know, entrepreneurs and, and, and startup community um, would have a, a level of tolerance around that. The when you were talking before about sort of the concept of um, sporting globe, we're I mean, just using sporting globe as, a, as an example, I guess. But in terms of being able to execute the idea of bringing that concept from a very different market, and maybe the Australian market is growing. You know, you talk about Thursday night football that was absolutely laughed at when it was first talked about. If you recall, not that not that long ago. Um, and weekday football, and I feel like we're slowly trying to replicate what the US have had for many, many, many years. Um, how do you start to uh, have your team have your team believe in the and buy into that vision? How do you maintain that enthusiasm? How do you how do you um, uh, paint the picture of what is going in, going through your mind so that your team can see that, feel that, live that, breathe that, and then see that through every day of the week while you're executing that process. How do you manage that? Well, we, we do an um, annual review, a strategic plan that we do filter down through the business. Um, and I think that's we like that to be big, bold, and inspirational. You know, we love sharing big five-year goals and vision and you know, right now, um, you know, we're very open about, um, you know, we want to go out, grow right now from 34 venues to 60 venues um, over the next five years. And we've got a clear path of how we're going to do that. Um, and it's really exciting for our team um, to have such a, be part of something with such a bright future where we are growing. Um, I'm a big believer of the saying, you know, I always tell our team we're either growing or we're going. And the minute we're what not- What does that growing, mean? Well, the minute we're not growing, um, I think, things stop, things stifle, innovation stops. Mm. Um, you stop attracting new talent. Um, so mm. growth for a business is a vital part of the success. And the businesses, as I say, that stop growing, I think uh, risk stagnation and then risk um, uh, going backwards. So, um, you know, keep going or you'll be going. Um, is, is Keep growing or you'll be going is really important. Um, so I think sharing that and having that big picture uh, vision of of getting to uh, X Y Z store numbers, X Y Z team members, and then sharing you mm. know what that growth means for for our individual team members because um, we want them on the journey with us. 
I'm also really lucky that, um, I mean, we're, we're in a great fun business. It's fun to be around sports and beer and food and people and having a great time. Um, uh, so that, that's a, it's an energizing environment to work in. But there's also huge growth potential um, from a young person coming into our business, working their way up the ranks to be managers. And then ultimately, you know, we've got a franchise system. So um, of all of our venues, about uh, just under a third of them are franchised. And that means that our team member could have an aspiration to come in and start working in a dish room and end up owning a multi-million dollar business um, as part of our network. And we would we love nothing more than for that to happen, and it's happened on a on a couple of occasions. You you them. employ about I think twelve hundred people. How do you cultivate that? How do you um, know your people to the, to the extent that you know the the dishwasher ultimately wants to own a franchise? It, you've got a you. We run a, a system of. Um, uh, sevens. Um, and so uh, the system of sevens is that nobody has more than seven direct reports. And that started from May trial and error too. Um, I've had, a, you know, a number of direct reports up to the teens and I've had less than seven. Uh, for me, the right number ended up being about seven. I, right. felt I could understand seven people, have strong relationships with them, spend enough time with them, um, working with them on projects mm. that I needed my input into, um, coaching them. Um, and and um, so as a result, I've got seven direct reports. Each of those seven people have up to seven direct reports. Each of them have up to seven direct mm. reports, on and so forth. And so I think that's the first system is going, okay, well, if you've got a big number of people, how are we, how are we funneling that through in little, little family units? Uh, and then you're responsible for your family of seven. Um, and then with those seven people uh, on a monthly basis, uh, we do one-on-ones reviews where we're talking about goal setting, where we're reviewing pa- uh, past month performance, and we're talking about your your development and aspirations, um, and and ultimately working working your way um, through our business, whatever that um, aspiration might be. Mm. Um, we want to help you get there. That's our job as as being a good employer. When probably more more so in the earlier days, James. What advice would you give to people who are setting up their own businesses that are growing, uh, that, you know, it started with them uh, with their sleeves rolled up, they're doing anything and everything to a point where you need to start delegating and letting go of things. How, do you, how did you do that and what advice would you give to people that are at that stage that are looking to let go and focus on uh, things that are more strategic in nature or growing the business in other ways? It's a, it's a really challenging one um, because often when you're starting out too, you, you are jack of all trades and you're used to doing everything and, you've got, and you don't have the resource always to be able to um, uh, hire necessarily mm. the, the, the next best person who could take that on. Um, so I think two principles. One, accept that um, uh, you know, uh, done is better than perfect. And, uh, you know, mm. giving people responsibility where, you know, they might do it 80 or 90% of you, that's actually brilliant to the level that you think you could do that um, because then you'll get on and be able to do much bigger and other things. The second thing, which is always hard and when you're in it, is, um, is to hire great people and pay a bit more um, to get the people that you need. Um, and I think too often, you know, we invest in all sorts of other areas, but when you, when you hire um, people that are more skilled than you in certain areas, that's where you really grow and flourish um, and, and your business starts to grow exponentially. Yeah, I think the, 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 the done is better than perfect. I love that. Um, presumably, though, there's a lot, there, there would be a lot of ego that is difficult to, that, that would be difficult to put, put to the side and say, well, I'm not good at these things and I, I should let F- Fran take care of these other things and I, I need to then also back myself with the things that I'm really good at to be able to go and do and execute those things really, really well because Fran's not going to execute those three things as well as I am. Absolutely. And I think if you've got a big picture and a vision um, for where you want to be, um, depending on where that is. I mean, you, you, some people as an entrepreneur might see themselves heavily involved in the business 
um, at micro level of certain things. Um, others, if you want to grow and scale um, to, to a really big size, you know, you have no option but to mm-hmm. delegate and to expand in that way. So as soon as the penny drops and you see that, um, well, you know, that, that's, that you're inhibiting yourself if you don't follow that strategy. Is that just a, it's almost like the light, the penny drops and the light switches on. Is that kind of? I think so, for sure. And again, on on an entrepreneurial um, view, I mean, for me, um, again, I'm probably at the risk of sounding like a Buffett fan. Another um, (laughs) quote um, that I always remember from him is that manual labour is for the birds. Um, And he's, he's not wanting to sound derogatory, but I think the point is you need to make your capital work for you. That's one of the reasons why, um, you know, for me, from a, from a very young age, I, uh, owning my own business appealed to me. I liked the idea that the, um, that the effort I put in um, helped facilitate my own capital to grow at the most rapid rate that it could. Uh, and again, philosophically, if you're taking that viewpoint that you're investing in business to ultimately provide yourself financial freedom and, and freedom in your life, by making your capital work for you, um, well, you, you need to scale and invest in a business that can operate with or without you. Do you think people can still achieve those things, James, without running a business and without um, doing all the things that you've just talked about, where they might be uh, working for someone in a management role or, or whatever role, it doesn't matter what it is, but they're not necessarily running their own business. Um, do you think they can't still ha- do those things? I think, I mean, you can still make your capital work for you if you're working um, for somebody in a career, for sure, um, through the proper, you know, good, good investment channels and what's what, what not. But for me, when I looked at it and I got into business very young, I was 24 when I started the business. Um, for me, I thought that was the fastest way to do it. And I think when if you look at um, uh, people that have built a lot of wealth that are younger, uh, I'd say in most cases they've, they've gone out on their own. And they've made, uh, they've generated a lot of wealth through their own business. Why is fast important to you? You said before that that was the fastest way. Why, why was fast so important to you at that time? I think all of it. It was trying to get to a point where, um, again, you've got you achieve complete financial freedom and, and freedom in your life to choose and do what you want. So I think, I don't know. For me, I always looked up and aspired to to those that um, were able to do that young. Um, you know, the nightmare for me would have been, you know, somebody handcuffed to their desk in their 50s, um, you know, working for the man. Mm. Do you feel like um, when the business first started, you were almost doubling down on your investment in the business? So beyond the fact that, you know, compared to if you're working for a corporate or whatever the case, maybe you don't have that income coming in, but... You know, I had a conversation with someone who recently left their job and they set up their own, where well, they're in the process of setting up their own own firm. And I said, oh, why'd you do it? And, and she said to me, because I want to spend more time with my family and my kids. And I've got young kids. And I said, how's that going? And they said, I, I'm, I'm seeing them even less now. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that you talk about these things and then you listen to real life stories. And I know this firsthand as well, where you people make these decisions for a uh, a, a greater good or a, or a deeper meaning or whatever the case may be. Yet, certainly in the earlier days, when I, even earlier, you, may, you might be three, five, seven, ten years in and you're still not where you thought you'd be. I mean, is there a perception that running your own business and, and starting up a company or whatever the case may be, you have all those things that everyone sets out to, to try and have? I, I think 100% you're right in the first couple of years. Um, and I think you've got to be willing to put in um, way more hours and effort. Was my experience um, than what you're doing working in a in a in another career for somebody else initially. And you want to because it's your baby and you're into it. Um, that's one of the reasons why I really advocate people to start as young as they can because um, it minimises the downside for you. You've got more time to do that before you've had kids. Mm. Um, makes it a bit more challenging, not impossible, but a bit more challenging once you had. You've got more sacrifice to make there. Um, but even from a financial view, of course, um, if you lose everything when you're 24, it's very different to losing everything when you're 34 or 44 mm. and kids. Um, or if you're, you're um, you know, more established and you'd already 
you know, um, got a long way into a mortgage or whatnot. Mm. So um, to your point, um, I believe if you've got a good business and you don't have a good business, if after seven years um, you are still not able to make those choices more freely, the first two years I think you have to be committed to do whatever it takes. Um, but, but after that, and after you've done that and hopefully got the business to a point, probably like testing the wings and having a system for it, you've either got the business to a point where it can be your future or maybe it's not the right business. Mm. Um, and, and you need to be really um, aware of that and, um, and make the right decision when you're a couple of years in. Sounds like uh, there's something magical about the number seven for you and signature hospitality. I don't know, the number seven keeps popping up. Um, uh, on that note, actually, uh, 2017, I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys bought TGI Fridays from Imperium Group from memory. Was it in 17? That's right, yeah. So, mate, like what, I don't know, like TGI Fridays back then, I don't know, I just feel like it didn't have what it has now. And, you know, I commend you guys for being able to transform that business from what it was to what it is now. Maybe that was the pathway that TGIF was heading down anyway. And it was whether Signature had it or Imperium or whoever had it, it would end up this way. But, you know, hats off to you guys. I think you've done a tremendous job in the, in the look, the feel, the experience, the aesthetics, just everything compared to what it was. But I'm curious, man, what did you see in TGIF back then? Because I don't know. I don't get a sense that it was all that of a place to be. And tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know. This is, a, no, this is an outsider's to, perspective. Mate, I think, I mean, Fridays, it had had a, an enormous heyday, started in the jam factory over 20 years. Yep, yep, yep. And, you know, I remember growing up, um, you know, when I was, you know, probably in my teens, um, you know, it was absolutely the place to be um, down Chapel Street there. Um, but I think uh, my point that I made before about if you're not growing, you're going, um, I think mm. the land got stagnant. And I think they got to about 10 um, restaurants, locations. And then across the country, uh, eight in Melbourne, eight in Victoria, um, yep. one in Sydney, and one in um, South Australia. And I think, um, you know, again, in fairness to, you know, the previous ownership, they'd had them for 16 or 17 years, the brand here. And again, that, that group were um, invested in a, a large range of other businesses as well um, and had just deployed capital to other businesses and growing other things. Um, so Fridays, as a result, mm. um, hadn't opened a new store for a while. Um, and I think, as I said, the minute that um, we, we bought it, we were able to start opening new stores, innovating again. We reduced the size of the footprint. Um, we reduced the size of the menu and modernised the menu, launched loyalty, um, and uh, we uh, started growing the business in a state. The opportunity that I saw was Fridays started in 1965 in New York. It's an authentic, and when I did my homework, I was probably in similar vein to you thinking, um, is there something in this when I saw the, the business marketed for sale? Um, and at first I thought maybe not. Is it a conversion job where maybe some of these could be great sporting globes? But the more I learned about the brand, um, uh, the more I fell in love with it. And basically it's history from 1965 where it was opened as a effectively a very um, uh, libertarian idea to create a bar for women. It was mad men sort of macho, era and basically to go to a bar back then you had to have a gentleman take you if you're a female and alan stillman the founder of friday said this is bullshit it's 1965 i'm opening a cocktail bar where women are absolutely welcome with or without a bloke um let's go and he created the long island iced tea and it was an absolute boom the thing went nuts it was the first bar anyone lined up to to go to in manhattan they launched the first happy hour i mean just so many amazing um, feats that the brand did for hospitality. And then I looked at it and went, wow, they're in 60 countries around the world. Um, you don't, you, you can't have a bad business that can achieve mm. 60 countries around the world successfully and grow in those markets. Nearly a thousand restaurants, 3.7 billion global, global turnover, 75,000 people. So whenever I look at something, I, I like to walk into any business and say, okay, this, it's easy to be the critic. But what are the things they're doing right here? And there were some things there that I liked. 
And then the things that I thought were opportunities, um, I wrote them down, talked about them with people I trusted, and I thought it's it's doable, it's fixable, um, and it would add a lot of synergy to our group. We were only seven sporting globes at the time, we acquired 10 Fridays um, and have managed to grow both together. We've got a very similar supply chain. Um, we've got great synergy across some core service from mm. finance, HR, um, a little bit marketing, um, digital, IT, um, procurement, um, development. So it was, it was a really great way to accelerate our broader business, help the Sporting Globe brand grow as well as Fridays grow. Um, and touch wood to date, um, despite the challenges of COVID, um, you know, coming into COVID, we were in a, we got the brand into a much better and strong position um, to, to, um, to launch and grow nationally. That was the other thing. Only eight in Victoria. You got a brand that has brand recognition in every state of Australia and New Zealand. And I bought the license for New Zealand too. So the minute I open a Fridays in um, you know Queensland, um, it booms because it's first time brands ever been there and everybody's heard of it. Um, it's it's a famous brand um, that that uh, people know from around the world. Uh, I think was it in two thousand and nineteen? I think just before the pandemic, you opened up Chadston, which was. Was that the largest Fridays well, that you have? Not, not largest in size, but probably a larger of the newer format. And effectively, um, you know, uh, it's, I mean, Chadston is the biggest shopping centre in the Southern Hemisphere. It is just an absolute gorilla in terms of, um, of size and how it performs. And we're really proud. I mean, Fridays is the number two performing um, restaurant at Chadston Shopping Centre behind uh, there's one yum char that I think, you know, yeah, man, I, I know the yum char. That place is insane. <laughs> that, that joint does, you know, we're talking well north of 10 mils, um, enormous. Um, but outside of that, I mean, Fridays is an absolute um, monster there. Mm. And, you know, the fit out there, we're really, really proud of. It's got a really cool um, New York style bar, island bar. Um, you know, we've used a lot of higher end finishes. There's, I mean, there's 12 floor tiles throughout the joint, um, you know, uh, and, big open kitchen and that was really the the launch in victoria of the new look fridays um, which we worked really hard with international on on creating that prototype 12 it's the 12th version of friday's fit out and i'm really proud to say now that fit out that we've done there in chadston is not being rolled out just in australia but also internationally because it's oh wow great. yeah that's awesome um can we talk about covid uh i think it would be um, foolish of me not to bring that up in in the light of in the line of business that that you're in. Like, what what does what does the future of hospitality look like, James? Because this is the business that you're in. You've been in this business for for many many years. You've got a um, um, well, I won't say diverse because you mentioned before that the the, the different business that you have do leverage each other and complement each other, uh, et cetera. But I'm just really curious now w- with what you've developed over time and you talk about Chadston being opened up just before the pandemic. Um, you acquired All Hands Brewing. I don't know whether that was before the pandemic or when the pandemic hit and you knew the pandemic hit and you still bought it anyway. Uh, and I think that's probably no, that a separate... Before the pandemic. Oh, so you signed the de- you signed on the dotted line before the pandemic? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And then and it hit. reported in the paper, so I'm happy to say it was 20 million bucks that we settled in February and got closed down in March. Far out. Uh, well, you did say that you used you used it as an opportunity before to to um, do some renos, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, you, you have to um, find things to do um, when you're faced with that, and you've got to think outside the square and and um, pivot, as everyone talked about through the pandemic. The really um, great things that have come out of it, I mean, the acceleration of, um, of tech and the digitization of our industry, which was coming, always coming, but the pandemic sped that right up. So, um, I mean, we've got now contactless digital ordering as an option in every single one. What does that even mean? Based order online? No, through our app, through our app you can come in, um, sit at the table, tap a beacon on our table and uh, oh, okay. order whatever you want. Um, so there's great convenience for the guests to do that. And also um, it takes pressure off our staff team. 
So there's actually some, some real win-wins um, and you can still elect to order the traditional way too if you want. But over half of our trade now is happening through through that when we are open in between shutdowns sure. we've seen. So that's an enormous change, right? On top of that too, delivery was less than 1% of our business pre-pandemic. We were obviously able to focus incredibly on growing that through the pandemic. And we think that's going to be ancillary revenue that holds and makes our business better long-term. In America, they're always a decade ahead, but um, delivery and to-go was probably about 20, 25% of the Friday's business and of most big casual dining brands in the US versus 1% of what we had here. Wow. So again, we've caught up a huge amount through the pandemic. Yeah. When we reopen and every time we've reopened, trade has boomed back. Our core demographic are younger, um, it's young families in Fridays and, and younger male skew in Sporting Globe. Um, they're desperate to get back out. Um, see but is that just food. a blip like, James? Is that just a, we've opened back up, everyone wants to get out of the house. And if we're, I'd like to think this is a uh, when and not an if. We, when we're open for long enough that that spike in everyone wants to get out starts to plateau and, and normalise, I'm sure it'll boom and, and whatnot. But the thing that I'm really curious about um, with, and, and I wanted to ask you is what does the future of entertainment and hospitality look like? Because you and Signature Hospitality and Sporting Globe and, and Fridays or whatever, you are, make, you are constantly making investments. You are looking at new venues. You're either buying them, you're leasing them. You're deve- you're, you've just said that version, version 12 of your store fit out pre-pandemic is almost the blueprint for the stores globally. Yep. You're investing all into the some of these decisions based on your outlook yep. of what is going on in the world. And whether that's the economy, people's financial situations, pandemics, no pandemics, all of these things. What in your mind, what are you looking at? What do you see as the future for entertainment and hospitality? Are you then uh, having much smaller footprints because you think, uh, takeout's going to be twenty five percent of of revenue. Just maybe, just talk us through what's going through your mind and what the group's looking at. Add into the horizon as we hopefully Sydney's got some sort of plan to unlock. Maybe Melbourne follows suit. I don't. I don't know. But I'd love to get your perspective on that. Uh, the growth of takeaway that means looking at our systems and our back of house and making sure that we've got the right setup for that going forward. Again, we're really lucky because. We, we always expected that it was going to come, um, but it's COVID's accelerated it. Because you've got to remember, as I said, we look to the US where the brand is and has been for such a long time. And they'd already been doing 20% takeaway for years. Um, so I think that, that that will change the way that we look at some of our sites. What do we do in response to that? Predominantly Fridays has been shopping centre base, Sporting Globe's 50-50. Um, no doubt we'll take more high street sites um, we're also very fortunate that most of our sites are suburban. And I think one big change that might happen out of COVID for a period there is work, for, work from home. Now, is that here to stay? Do businesses allow flexibility for years to come um, for certain employees to work a couple of days a week from home? And where we see that, um, we actually benefit tremendously. Um, because people working from home are, are more likely to be able to go out and, and dine midweek um, suburban. Mm. All around the world, um, and again, we don't have a crystal ball for what the business looks like in two years, as you say, um, if you think it's just a pop after COVID, but we're seeing all around the world sales really strong coming out of the pandemic from Southeast Asia to um, Europe to Middle East to um, the UK, Fridays has 88 uh, restaurants in the UK. Um, in the UK, they're up, you know, significantly on pre-pandemic sales um, and often with restricted numbers. Now, I take your point, there's pent-up demand. We've also got a massive savings level. I mean, one of the highest rates of savings in mm. Australia right now for the past few decades. So I think that is likely to get unleashed on hospitality. Um, as is the fact that all of our international uh, travel um, consumption is, is now getting redirected in Australia right now. Um, but long term, fundamentally, what gives me great confidence in our industry is that, you know, people do come straight back 
and we miss our friends and our family. And they are, when you survey people of what they've missed the most coming out of lockdowns, um, it's connecting with their friends and family. 100%. And we do and come together and we do in venues, in, in restaurants and in bars. That and getting a haircut. I see you've got a cap on today, Rob. So. Oh, man. I had a beard. Like I tried to give myself a trim and I had to get, I had to shave the whole thing off because it was, yeah, it just didn't, it didn't work well. So I think, to answer your question, fundamentally, more suburban locations, uh, greater uh, amount of to go and, and our infrastructure to support that. Definitely more um, digital ordering um, and a continuation of, of digitization in, in on premise venues. Um, and then, of course, for a period now, I mean, we're about to face in Sydney where we reopened, but only to the vaccinated. And where how does that work? Basic, Who polices this? Well, this is it. They've got the um, the uh, New South Wales Health Services app, which you QR check in with, and they're linking that to the federal database, um, which will only give you now the tick um, if if that database says you've been vaccinated. So when when uh, anyone enters a venue, we're only allowed to permit. Uh, people that have that green tick um, into our New South Wales locations. Once we hit 70% 40 vax, which is expected to be sort of, you know, early to mid-October. Are you getting backlash from consumers, James? Look, I think ultimately um, there will be a few people that are really strongly and adversely, you know, you know adverse to that, that whole system. Um, in Australia, you know, we've got really high vaccination uptake. And, um, uh, uh, you know, the vast majority of our staff want to get vaccinated. Um, and I think the fact that, um, you know, Australia looks like we're going to achieve an 80% vaccination target, I mean, that, that'll be as high as, I mean, as anywhere around the world, really. Um, and, and, you know, uh, the majority of, of, of people will be supportive. And again, uh, is it going to be in place forever? Um, I would hope not. Um, I would think that, uh, you know, it, it could be around for a, for a, a fair period, though. Um, certainly, you know, we're talking more than 12 months um, mm. where, you know, we're just going to have to find a way to live like that. Mm. Just further to the comments you were making before about the, the future of food and entertainment, um, uh, you, you're either buying venues, you're leasing venues. What's... What's sort of the point of view internally? Because you're, if you're buying a venue, you're going to be, you're going to be uh, putting, putting up quite a bit of money and capital, which you then tie up into, um, into your business. And if you're making these types of bets, you're going to be pretty damn confident about um, the economy picking up and, and so on and so forth. You've just mentioned the, you see, um, quite a strong pre-pandemic levels in a lot of the other countries that you're looking at, call them sister stores in, in the UK and, and in the Middle East and, and so on and so forth. Can we talk more about economically and pe- people's households, the way they spend? You know, what, what's, what, what are you guys crystal balling as it relates to um, uh, people's spending habits, uh, mm-hmm. investors, and the way you deploy your capital? Is that has that changed significantly from pre-pandemic levels? If anything, mate, we're going harder because I think um, I think the again at the space we're in um, will be really really strong. Um, suburban restaurants um, and bars. So again, doubling down on that. If you look at um, you know where smart money and industry has gone to, and by smart money I'm talking about bigger groups. Sure, uh, we do have some big big. Um, you know, uh, Molus is a huge investment bank that own about 40 pubs. Um, ALH owned by Woolworths. They're the largest pub owner in the country, about 330 pubs. KKR, one of the biggest, you know, um, private equity firms in the world. Um, they have 170 pubs in Australia. So some smart money's in the space because um, it's been a very, very stable space. Um, you know, other than a pandemic, um, most normal impacts... Which knocked out most industries anyway. Yeah, most normal recessions per se, we mm-hmm. are super resilient to. Uh, people keep drinking beer, people keep eating comfort food um, and people keep seeing their friends and family. So I'm, I'm a big believer that the world continues to drink beer, eat food and see their loved ones. Um, fundamentally, I think that's going to keep happening. I think it'll continue to happen more in the suburbs which is where we're strongly based and will continue to invest and grow. In terms of rates of return, again, 
We've got interest rates super low, won't be forever, but I still see them staying um, relatively low compared to what we've experienced in past decades for the next decade ahead. Um, and you can fix money right now. I mean, we've got a 10 year bond rate at 1.1 and you know, um, businesses able to go out and borrow money. If, you're, if you've got a strong business, you're borrowing money at you know, two, two and a bit percent. Um, mm. pretty, pretty attractive. Um, in terms of what we can go and do now, um, again, uh, there will be some hesitation from some in the market and we're, we're opportunistically out there um, looking to acquire, looking to find new sites. I think the other thing that happens out of um, any periods of uncertainty, you actually find franchising does very well on the back end. People like control of their own lives. Um, people don't like um, businesses, for example, um, you know, standing them down or or something happening to them. So mm. if, if I own, if I can own my own business um, again and feel like I'm in more control of my own destiny, um, that has some appeal to people. And we're expecting some really strong um, franchising interests coming out of this and seeing that already, particularly, again, we know the trade interstate. Queensland's booming right now for us. Mm. Western Australia is booming for us right now. Um, so, again, I, I don't think um, you know, there's some, you know, crazy fundamental um, shift uh, that, that, that changes too dramatically beyond what I've already described. Um, and I think in terms of return on investment, I mean, the government support last year was just tremendous for our industry. Um, and uh, that enabled a lot of, um, you know, our industry to, to get through. And if you were smart and engaged and to go and utilise staff well and work with your teams well, you probably fared quite well. Our group didn't break, you know, we've continued over a long period of time uh, for franchise partners to be delivering 25% ROI. Um, and I, again, when I ever I look at investments, I'm looking for at least that ROI. Um, and that's why I often double down in my business because I can mm. leave that there. Um, and, and again, I think it's pretty strong returns compared to um, you know, traditional markets or, or other investment opportunities. I've been very surprised and I am amazed as to how our economy has been able to be so resilient over the last 12 or 18 months, notwithstanding all the things that, that, are, um, that are going on. The thing that I'm really curious about is you, you keep talking about um, uh, main streets and suburbia and whatnot. Are, are the cities dead, man? Like what's, what's your point of view? Why are you not investing in, presumably there's some, I don't know, good deals to be picked up, whether it's freehold business, freehold in the city or leases. Uh, are the city dead? Is the city dead, James? No, look, I, I think um, uh, cities eventually will um, come back. I just think it's a slightly slower recovery, um, obviously driven by you know a couple of core factors, which is the return to office, um, and particularly we're talking about big companies um, that have you know hundreds and thousands of staff, mm -hmm. um, and and their conservatism in returning staff to the office and their their ongoing flexibility policy, because let's face it, in Australia. In hospitality, we're seeing a massive shortage of staff with international... Um, uh, uh, it's a migration uh, issue, though, isn't it? Massive migration issue. But also, we lost a lot of... There were 700,000 student visas in Australia. We're now down to 400. When are they coming back? Um, there mm -hmm. were a um, lot of skilled workers um, that were on visas that have left. Because remember, they were not, none of them were supported through the JobKeeper program. So a lot of them were faced with no other choice but to leave Australia. Mm. Uh, and, and I'm um, critical of that decision by our government because I think not, not necessarily on tourist visa holders, for sure, they should have gone home, I believe, but skilled visa holders that we bought here, bought their families out here, said you're fulfilling a skill that we as a country need, mm. um, move their life here, and then we didn't support them. That didn't feel right. Mm. Uh, and we need them now. We've got staff shortages. And guess what? They're not here yet. So... Yeah. Um, I think fundamentally, just back to the point um, of, of CBDs, um, that, that shortage of staff, I think we'll see businesses offering a lot of flexibility um, to try and attract people. So again, if we've got less people working in the city and then we've got less students in the city where some of the universities are mm. and perhaps less people living in the cities too because there's been a flight to suburbs, regions, wanting more space, wanting to live by the beach, the sea change, 
Um, those shifts, I think, will see um, uh, the recovery in the CBDs take a bit longer. And look, for mine, as I said, that just means, I mean, we've got greater opportunity in suburbs anyway, because there's more of them. If I'm going to put a Fridays or a Sporting Globe in the city, how many can I do? One or two? Mm. Um, versus, you know, again, I'm, I'm rolling out 60 locations over the next five years. That's going to be in the suburbs. Yeah, yeah. I, it uh, sounds like you don't want to play that game for a little while and let that one uh, take care of itself for now. Mate, I think you've done a, a tremendous job. You know, I talked about my outsider's as a consumer's perspective on 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 Fridays and and Sporting Globe since seems to be popping up um, wherever you start to look now. So mate, well done, congratulations on that. I think you've done a a tremendous job and be able to have a team of people that can continue to um, uh, roll out the strategy and, and execute. And I think I think it's um job well done, mate. Final final question for you: What's What's James's advice to people that are looking at setting up their own businesses or uh, wanting a, a change in what their life is about right now, where they're working for a corporate or someone they've always wanted to kind of do this thing? Like, what, what are the key lessons you've learned that you you wish maybe someone had told you um, 15 years ago? Yeah, I think whenever you're making a big decision in life, um, you know, take your time and talk to a lot of people because there will be enough people around you to give you sound advice. Um, and the people are happy to help you out, right? Like uh, Absolutely. Reach out to people in the industry, um, you know, talk to them and do, do your homework um, in, a, in a big way before you, you obviously make any shift. And then, as I said, I, you know, uh, echoing what I said earlier, um, really think about what is the downside um, and work out, well, how do I mitigate all of that? And like for me, for example, I bought an existing pub um, that was run that, that was underperforming. Um, it had very new assets though in it. It had new bathrooms, new kitchen, new looking bar. So um, the downside for me was I knew I bought it at a good price. I was testing a concept um, and, and committed to get that right and make it work. Um, but in a worst case scenario, if it didn't work, um, I had a business model there with a liquor license um, that had value and I could exit. Um, so again, you know, that's just one example of thinking through, um, you know, how much is at risk here and what is, what is failure look like? What's the exit and can I live with that? Um, so, um, again, I, you know, do a really strong plan, talk to lots of people, um, you know, make sure that you enter an industry or a business that has tailwinds. It's really hard running uphill, especially it's hard enough when you're mm -hmm. starting something, let alone starting something that's got you know, that's got a headwind um, against it. So pick an industry that's that's growing, um, that, that uh, everyone knows has a great future. Um, make sure you differentiate yourself and stay true to those points of differentiation because um, differentiation and competitive advantage are the key to achieving um, uh, higher profit and profit is, is ultimately what you need to be successful in business. James, uh that's awesome, mate. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks very much for, for your time today. Hey, thanks for having me on and I hope it helps a bit with your listeners and well done on all you're doing um, with your podcast. They're great. Thanks, mate.